God bless you, everyone. Dave here with another uh, video. Uh, this event is called uh, The Fight for Your Identity. And we've been working with the book, uh, Six Battles Every Man Must Win. Um, and uh, my presentation is about the fight for your identity for my brothers in Christ. So what do we mean by your identity? It is the identity God gave you as a man. The many testimonials I'll share tonight will paint a picture of my journey of fighting for my identity. Here's a spoiler alert. Fighting for your identity without God doesn't work. For every piece, for every piece of my history and testimony I share with you tonight, the glory all goes to God. There's nothing to boast about here. What God has given me, I give to you by testimony of God's glory and what he has done in my life. In the past, I would have been embarrassed, but today I know that my testimony is all for the glory of the kingdom of God. I share with my brothers so that you know you aren't alone. So our agenda, the culture of man, we're going to talk about the culture of men. We'll talk about our fight to survive. We'll talk about that law springs faith. We'll also learn that our not knowing actually protects us. Um, we'll talk about how men are missing the big picture. We'll talk about what men need, and it's from God. We'll talk about a man's identity. It's not female or gay. And we'll talk about how the world tries to decide our identity. And we'll wrap it up with uh, God knows what is right for you as it relates to your identity. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the culture of men. Culture. The measure of a man is what he owns. That's how we live today. The house, the car, it's a measurable amount. The bank account, a uh, number of kids. That was true for my family for many years. Titles, degrees, this corporate culture, that defines this. The result of, of this culture, it's the battle of fatigue, stress, burnout, competition. The wife walks out the door, never ending debt, loss of self-respect leading to suicide, those kinds of things. Um, we need to fight back. Now, page 33 of the book that we've been talking about, uh, it talks about, uh, it says this. Uh, today, our battle isn't with swords and shields. Our war is against an invisible spiritual enemy and the cultural forces he uses to bully us. Now, in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We need to stand our ground. That's why we have the full armor of God. We've also been talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Now let me show you uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Thir uh, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Now we're covering six battles man must overcome. They are spiritual battles, but we must fight in those battles. We'll learn here and at our Sunday and Wednesday services at the Resurrection Center, those biblical strategies. Um, now let's talk about our fight to survive. Now going back to the book, which again is by Bill Perkins. It's the six battles every, uh, every man must win and the ancient secrets you'll need to succeed. It talks about a story about Benjamin Martin in the Revolutionary War as portrayed in the movie, The Patriot. He had a peaceful life after getting married and having seven children. He stayed out of war to have a peaceful life after his wife died and he had to care for his children. Gabriel, his oldest son, goes to war. Benjamin helps both sides of the war with medical aid. As a consequence, the story shows the result of his first and second sons killed and his farm burned. He worked hard for peace, comfort, love, and a place of safety. But the consequences were a total loss and fear. Things like that change a man to fight. That changed Benjamin. He saw that being passive did not bring peace and did not protect his family. His anger put him back in the war that he tried to avoid and to be a leader. Benjamin had anger and determination. We have values and we must fight to maintain them. That is our identity. We all have come into a place of fear because we have lost peace, comfort, love, and a place of safety 
at one time in our lives. With that loss, we forget who we are. We forget what God wants us to be. If we fight, then we can rediscover our identity. We can eventually come into a place of knowing what and who God wants us to be. Satan attacks us, and when we lose so much, we fight and seek God. Now let's talk about how loss brings faith. Today I will open up on a few stories to illustrate examples of the fight for our people. It's not a boast, it's not a pride, it certainly ain't pretty. But it's to draw a picture from my perspective to show you that you have your own perspective. We all come from different backgrounds as unique as our thumbprint and social security number. No one person is the same as another. Use my example as one of many. Just like Benjamin, I lost so much from alcoholism. Let me tell you, it was a dark history of addiction that nearly cost me my life on multiple occasions. I'm not proud of it. I'm not here with a bright studio lights and pretty virtual backgrounds because of what I did. God has me here today for a reason. That's why I was delivered from that dark past. I'm fighting now and have been for many successful years in that area of addiction. I've been victorious for many years. The glory goes to God. Faith gives us something to fight for. We fight for what Satan wants to take away from us. I'll bring you to 1st of Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life of which you were called when you were made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And again, that's in 1st of Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. 12. It is a spiritual struggle whereby we stand firm in the truth of God's word and battle against the world, the flesh, the devil, and our own self-will. Fighting the good fight of faith is not so much hostile combat against a physical enemy, but rising to the challenges of our Christian life or confidentially, or I should say confidently, taking hold of the eternal life that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we fight the good fight of faith, we are trusting God in all things. And in doing so, we are taking hold of eternal life. Eternal life is not only about living forever in the life to come, but it is about living a victorious life in the here and now. It is about growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and developing a precious intimacy with him as we abide securely in his love. Now, let's talk about our not knowing protects us. Now, let me tell you a story about not knowing the full picture God knows about you and the situation. As a kid, I wanted to go on a school trip to Washington, D.C. It was a big deal for freshman year of high school. My father said, it's not worth going to a place you don't know. The promise was, if I knew Washington, D.C., then I could go. I had two books to learn from. I studied. One was about monuments. The other was all about the streets and where everything was. By a set deadline, I knew streets, directions, monuments, everything. My twin sister is my witness. See, same grade. She was part of this as well. Uh, but she saw all the work I put into it. She gave up on the fight. She didn't want to learn. It didn't matter to her. She wasn't concerned about the commitment. When I proved my commitment, he said that since I already knew Washington, uh, Washington D.C., that I didn't need to go. I'd worked so hard for something and it was taken away. My twin sister chuckled because she got the same result as I did and she didn't have to work hard for the disappointment. But I did not see the big picture. It's not anyone's fault. He never wanted me to go on the trip in the first place. I did not know he had a good, very good reason. I was too young to understand. He did not expect me to learn so well from the two books. He was thinking that I would have failed. My father had government contracts involving international issues related to high technology for satellites in space. Okay, Defense Department. <laughs> I was too young for him to be able to explain to me the risk of his own children walking the streets of Washington, D.C. He made the right decision. He made up for it. He brought my younger brother and I to New York City. We were at the finest restaurants. You know me, I love food. We went on a helicopter ride and circled the Statue of Liberty just before sunset. That's the way to see it. That's the way to see the statue. After 9-11, that type of tour is no longer possible. 
My father made a decision that made me very sad. But in the end, he was right. And he showed his love with the New York trip. I understood years later, decades later. It was in 2012. I was a flight engineer flying in a helicopter testing military device applications. My company was sub subcontracted by my father's company. Flying over the Mass Pike from Boston to Westover Air Force Base reminded me of the flight around the Statue of Liberty decades ago. I also knew of what the sensitivity of walking around Washington, D.C. years ago would have been as now in 2012 been associated with military applications. Things like that could not be explained to a young boy. It took decades to finally see the full pictures. This is an example of a big picture that is too big for us to understand. We can be disappointed by something that is one small piece of a much larger picture intended to protect us. Our direction can't be chosen. Using God helps with that direction. God has the big picture. We may not understand it. We must trust it. God knows. We don't. That's why we say, let God be God. Now let's talk about what men need. Men don't learn how to be men in a vacuum. It doesn't happen that way. Boys need teachers and mentors who ultimately point them toward a relationship with God. Learning to cultivate peer and mentor relationships with other men is often the beginning of creating the capacity for a fathering relationship with God. That's what the Braveheart of Men's Group is all about. Masculine needs that were not supplied early in life can be recaptured as an adult if the man is in search of it. In Proverbs 27, 17, it reads, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Our attraction to the opposite sex is a mystery. Let's think about that. Intuitively, the drive to bond with the opposite sex seems so much more than just reproduction. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, the Apostle Paul describes the one flesh relationship between a husband and a wife as imitating Christ's relationship with the church. A reciprocal pattern of sacrifice and submission to each other is the model God sets for marriage. Now, let's talk about man's identity. It is important that a boy leaves childhood with a secure sense of masculinity because at puberty, our sex drive is turned up. If not, then, well, we know the story. It's all about LGBTQ. We are sexually attracted to what is mister, mysterious to us. It's how we are wired. So we need it to be guided. If we are not developed with a secure sense of masculinity, then what we are sexually attracted to, uh, us misguided. A secure man knows who he is and feels comfortable in his masculinity and can safely pursue his opposite. Men that have trouble with commitment in their relationships often have trouble in their developmental jump. They feel an unstable sense of masculinity and fear of being re-engulfed in their mother relationship by attaching to a woman. Learning to embrace masculine traits and how to balance them against female traits is a process that starts in childhood. But then again, if the process doesn't start, dot, 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 signs of masculine insecurity may include failure to achieve goals, unable to commit to a relationship, lack of confidence, lack of centeredness, addictions, and other narcissistic personality traits. We need to help our children with their development. It starts early. God can help those who start late. It's a decision of trust in the Lord for that to happen. When we become reborn into Christ, we receive a new nature with Godward affections, enabling us to cast ourselves upon Christ and receive forgiveness of sin. Our entrance into God's family as children is the key that unlocks the rest of the Christian life. You may feel hardened. You may have regrets. But in Christ, your natural heredity rec record of sin is forgiven and your guilt may be removed. You are free to live above the attacking voice of your inner demons. Christian men must begin to build their self-conception on their status as sons of God. To be a child of God is, in part, to be a passive recipient of God's grace and paternal affection. But Christian men are also to be fathers, active workers in others' lives, not merely in the physical sense, but in the sense that their first-hand knowledge of God qualifies them 
to influence others. Just as with mature manhood comes the longing to impart to a son the wisdom, skills, and values gained along one's journey, so with Christian manhood comes the desire to plant a spiritual leg legacy in others. In our youth, God graciously adopts us into his family and gives us a new name. In our maturity, we call others to receive that same adoption, and we cultivate a new generation as his namesake. The more we grow in our understanding of who Jesus is, the more we will come to understand who we are as men. This question of identity is a crucial one, for what we think about ourselves is the pivot of our existence. Every day, in one way or another, we live out who we think we are. Yet our identity can only come from the outside, exterior to ourselves, and it comes from the voices we have listened to. What are those voices? Sometimes it's the voice that shames us through mockery or public criticism. Other times it's the voice that offers us praise only when we perform up to certain standards. Now let's talk about how the world tries to decide our identity. Now my natural father wanted it be me to be an electrical engineer. He was a physicist. He said, I would always have a job because a physicist can keep a hundred engineers busy. Now I applied to Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston and I got accepted. That's where I wanted to go. My parents decided that I would go to the University of Massachusetts instead because that is where my four other, four older brothers went. I was okay with that. So the choice of studies and the choice of school I went to was someone else's. My identity was being created for me. It wasn't God's choice. Fast forward, with that, without that influence, this is what happened. I got a master's degree in education, nothing like engineering nothing like electrical engineer. He insulted the institution where I chose, where I got paid, where I paid, um, I paid for it. He didn't know that I was aware my godfather was on the board of directors at Cambridge College. He didn't like it when I brought that up, but that changed his opinion. I started a book publishing company. Uh, this was in 1994, nothing like uh, electrical engineering. He didn't like that it wasn't electrical engineering. When we won an award with a company only at two years old, that was in 1996, he changed his uh, opinion, okay? So let's talk about God knows what is right for you. You have the right, you have to fight with what is right for you. You have the right to do that. God has chosen something for you, not for others. I know it was right. I also know it was what God wanted. I've been in education for 34 years with many awards along the way. That's God shining his light. That's not me. I've been in business now reaching the world for 28 years. That's God shining his light. That's not me. On November 5th, uh, just recently, last year, my wife and I presented to the church the story of how my family had an image of the white girl from Boston I would marry. They didn't like the Spanish-speaking illegal alien from Colombia. Well, obviously I did. <laughs> you should have seen their reaction when I said I was going to marry her in two months. Four months later, I met her. I proposed two months after that we were married. That was about 20 years ago. 20 years later, my wife and I always tell people exactly how God orchestrated that. Why am I telling you this? It doesn't matter what people say you should do. Eventually, God will have his way. Let God be God. It won't even look like what you plan. You might have seen me wearing a bracelet. Uh, the scripture on it says, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. What does Jeremiah 29, 11 mean to us? Christians facing difficult situations today can take comfort in Jeremiah 29, 11, knowing that it is not a promise to immediately rescue us from hardship or suffering, but rather a promise that God has a plan for our lives. And regardless of our current situation, he can work through it to prosper us and to give us hope. Basically, whatever God has planned for you is a good thing. We all spend a lot of time in our jobs. Men introducing each other ask, what do you do? Women, not so much. Men ask each other that. In some ways, your job is your identity. It shows you as a provider for your family. It is your connection to a community. It's the skills you pass on to your kids or others. Hard skills, soft skills, inherent skills that, just, that are just part of your calling. 
It shows your kids purpose in life. It teaches your kids motivation, organization, and discipline. Kids watch how we handle responsibility as how we handle our jobs. Budgeting uh, teaches value for what we have. It shows we need to work for what we have. You know, 40 hours, uh, a 40 hour work week plus travel and early late arrival is about 168 hours total in a seven day week. It's about 30% of your time. A third of your life is spent in, our, in your job. Perhaps 50% or more of energy is spent in your jobs. The time and energy investment uh, for our job makes it worthy of our identity or making a connection. We demonstrate to our kids the importance of jobs, how they go to school. As parents, we send them there. So we have to know that whatever choice we make will determine what our children's identity is. If we're messed up with our identity now, we still have the time to fix it. Today, we talked about the culture of men. We talked about our fight to survive. We talked about loss brings faith. We talked about our not knowing protects us. We talked about men missing the big picture. And we talked about what men need, and it's from God. We talked about a man's identity. It's not female or gay. And we talked about how the world tries to decide our identity. And finally, we talked about God knows what is right for you. So what's the punchline? Use the Holy Spirit. God is waiting for you. So we're doing more with the series, Six Battles Every Man Must Win by Bill Perkins. Uh, today, we talked about the fight for your identity. It's good to see everyone. My name is Dave.